so I'm Jessica Gordon Nemhard. I'm a professor of community justice and social economic development in the City University of New York system, John Jay College. Um, I'm also the author of a book called Collective Courage, which is about the history of African American cooperativism. So, um, my, I actually interpreted this panel and our charge similarly, I guess, to um, John. My question is, is platform cooperativism the gateway to a larger co-op and commons movement, or how can it be if it isn't? Um, and I also, I think I was focusing more on social relations as well, and not so much the utilitarian value, but I agree if we get stuck in the utilitarian value, then we have more trouble seeing platform cooperativism as um, part of a social movement or a precursor to the social movement. So I was thinking if we start where people are, if more people are on the internet, more people are engaged in online platforms owned and operated by their users, um, then are participating in physical co-ops like a consumer or worker co-op, um, isn't that a good way to bring people into the rest of the movement because they're already interested in spending time doing something on open access and collective ownership on the internet. So I was trying to think about if we think about this as either a larger movement or even a parallel movement, then how do we join them? So my understanding of cooperatives and joint ownership is that there's a, a long and exciting learning curve, probably partly because of the social relationships that have to get built in order to um, participate democratically with other people, but also because these are economic systems and we spend most of our waking hours um, working supposedly, most of us do, some of us don't anymore, but since we spend so much of our waking hours in a work environment, if that work environment is actually more, um, more transactional, more solidarity related, more, um, I don't know what else, what, uh, more social relations about, then it seems like we're learning a lot in that situation, then we can apply it in other places. So, as I say, if we have a group of people who are practicing shared ownership, as they practice, they learn more about it, they perfect it better. Um, so that means they get some notion of cooperative ownership and structure, how it works, how it benefits, and they keep recreating those structures. To me, that means that they have skills and leadership that gets developed that they could then use to do to become social change makers. They could use it to also promote other kinds of um, cooperative and open ownership. They have transferable skills that we should be able to, to harness. It sort of sounds idealistic, and in some ways it is, but I do have to say that I have examples, at least in uh, African-American co-op history, and I have examples from studying worker co-ops and that kind of thing that says that we do, there is some kind of learning curve there are these different kinds of learnings. And so to me, we should think about, to me, I was thinking about this question of how do we make sure the people doing the platform economics learn in that way and, and do something more with it. And so I thought about the social capital. So again, back to social relationships. Um, we also know in the co-op world that social efficiencies are derived from democratic participation. So the fact that you're actually participating I agree that the face-to-face -face and the personal matters, but I also believe that there's something about the act of making decisions together, even if it's over uh, whatever that's called digitally, um, right? There's something about the teamwork, the intercooperation, combined with the notion of self-help and self-management um, that actually not just increases productivity and job satisfaction, but also civic engagement. And I've done a little bit of research on that as well. And so we can see how these things, participation, decision-making, shared decision-making develops leaders. And then what kind of leadership we heard about this morning also, it's that relational leadership, right? It's not the 
I'm the best and I'm the leader and nobody else can tell me what to do, but it's the, I understand how to how group process and how to work with other people to come to decisions. I know how to trust and build trust, that kind of thing. So again, I'm thinking about all the different types of attitudes and skills that could come out of people engaging in um, platform co-ops. And then I also think that the more, as I said, especially if you're doing this in your work life, the more that you get used to practicing those kinds of relationships and making decisions in those ways, the more you want it to happen in the rest of your life. So then there should be this natural progression, people who might be involved in platform co-ops on the internet should be more willing, interested, able to think about cooperativism, to think about commoning, to think about other kinds of co-op development. But the challenges, it seems to me, are at least three or four. One is, of course, corporate opposition, um, and we know it in the internet world, but we also know it, those of us who have tried to do or do co-ops, we know there's lots of opposition and it makes it really hard even though co-ops are resilient. Um, also, it's, I noticed this in a lot of consumer co-ops, but I assume it's a, it's a similar problem in platform co-ops. Co they don't actually recognize themselves as a co-op or as being part of the co-op movement or being part of a broader movement. Again, the, this is where the utilitarian might come in. They're just doing it because it makes sense economically for them to do it this way. So if they don't see themselves as part of a broader movement, don't see themselves as co-ops, then that's going to be a problem. And um, if they're not well educated about cooperative economics in terms of how to self-manage, how to handle um, collective decision making, how to build trust, et cetera, then that's going to be a problem too. So I wanted to look at those challenges, though I'm going to forget the corporate one because we all know the corporate challenge. I wanted to look at the other two challenges and see um, the ways that I think we can get over those challenges so that we can um, connect these movements and, and build that bridge. So the importance of co-op education. All the research I've done, and I guess now I've been researching co-ops for like 15 to 20 years, education has been key in every place that I've looked, um, particularly in, in the black world. Almost all the co-ops I found started out with study groups or some kind of educational component. And the strongest co-ops that I've seen um, continue to do good orientation and training and con that continuous education, which is one of the co-op principles. Um, for me, the challenge for the platform co-op movement is to make sure that its members continuously educate themselves about the co-op model, the collective decision model, the sharing economy model, the solidarity economy model, because otherwise, if they don't see that connection, they're not going to see that this is a stepping stone or a part of a bigger project and they're not gonna, and they may not be able to take their own projects to a higher level because they won't have that, that recognition, um, practice and movement from, from the utilitarian to the, the social good that it is. So I feel like one of the things, it's a challenge, but also it's a, it's a challenge to us in the movement to make sure that this happens, that this kind of education this kind of connection, you are co-ops, this is what it means to be part of the co-op community, that kind of thing. How do we make those connections? Public education, we all need to be talking about co-ops, so it's not just the, the internet people or just the co-op world itself. We need cross-sector dialogues. Even in the co-op movement, there's too much sectoralism and siloism, and sometimes the industries or the type of co-op, they don't talk across each other. So again, we need these dialogues, we need public education, more forums like this, I would, I would add. Um, we need to apply and add cooperativism to our economic and societal notions and challenges so that we see co-ops as a viable option. And we need to del deliberately involve youth, and I say youth because, and maybe I have a slide on it. Oh, I do in a minute, but not yet. I say youth because 
to me, young people are the ones who embrace this stuff easier, but also they bring families with them because their parents want to be supportive, they, they connect young people with older people, et cetera. And so to me, youth is one of the answers we've got. But before I finish talking about youth, I want to also talk about how co-ops require and promote education and training. And maybe I said all this already. Um, but co-ops do it through, you have to learn how to run your business, you have to learn the, you know, the, the, the mechanics of uh, transparent financing and open book management. You have to do the industrial training part, so there's lots of different training pieces. Also meeting facilitation and democratic participation. Again, the strongest co-ops teach and train each other about that and then practice those things so that they can run their meetings well, do their decision making well. Um, a well-trained board of directors, even though um, a lot of us believe in self-management that everybody should be part of the management team and everybody should be part of the governance, but it is true that some and many co-ops still have board of directors and they need to be well-trained and well-run. Then there's public education, which by that I mean in external to the co-op, but co-op members and co-op community doing it because the rest of the world needs to understand why we're a co-op or why we chose the co-op model, et cetera. So there's ways to make sure that more people know about it. It's also a way to connect, again, these different groups who are doing uh, siloed co-op stuff. And then training is continuous, especially for second and third generation co-ops. If you don't do that same level of training, the new people who come in don't understand why you're doing certain practices or how you're operating, and the trust gets lessened. The other piece about the public knowledge and the public education is that I actually see co-ops as part of a huge system that they can, some kind of co-op or solidarity economic structure can solve most of our economic and social problems. So I just gave you a little list there. Um, commodification and corporate ownership, obviously, the export of capital, because co-ops are more community owned, they can, uh, uh, what's the word, um, address predatory lending or stop predatory lending, especially through community development credit unions and other kinds of co-op credit, unemployment, you get worker co-ops, owning your own stuff, et cetera, I can go down the list. Some of my recent work is on um, prisons and re-entry and doing worker co-ops with prison populations. So to me, that's also part of this public education format is to let us know that we're not talking about very isolated, inflexible models, but we're talking about models that operate in a, through a variety of sectors, types, populations, industries, and solve a variety of problems. So finally, I wanna end with this youth involvement, and I think it's on both sides, right? To me, I see uh, the internet movement and platform co-ops as kind of being a youth movement. It seems like there's much more young people involved in this movement. Um, and so I'm heartened because I also think that young people in the co-op mainstream movement are essential to it also. And so I think about a couple of things. One is if we can train people when they're young, and they're not indoctrinated with the capitalist hierarchical structures that we all were indoctrinated in. Um, people have been laughing at me because I'm now on a rant against kindergarten. And everyone's like, why could you be, how could you be against kindergarten? Well, if you think about it, kindergarten is the first stage in teaching us how to not cooperate, right? What do you do in kindergarten? Well, some people say you play and you have fun and whatever, yeah, but the main point of kindergarten, in fact, you don't pass kindergarten if you don't learn the three principles of sit, in your, sit down in your chair, don't get up, and let, you know, you have to raise your hand to get up, don't talk to your neighbor, and don't touch your neighbor, right? So if we think about those things, what do we, in, co in co cooperatives, we, have to, we want the opposite, right? We want you to talk and talk and learn how to, talk to your neighbor and consult your neighbor and come up with joint decisions. We want you to learn how to do um, conflict resolution. We want the social relations, so we actually want you to touch each other and stuff, right? So anyway, you get the idea. Kindergarten is ruining everything for us. Um, <laughs> 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 but 
but we could make it do other things, right? It doesn't have to be that way, but at least kindergarten and capitalist society is just taking us downhill. Um, so I'm thinking we can connect with young people through platformism, right? If we're connecting, if young people are already excited about and doing this stuff in, in their internet world, we can connect them back to the co-op world through that, or we can be uh, just training them in the co-op world in general, and then the platform co-ops is just one piece of the co-op world that they're doing. Um, we can also help them to solve personal and community problems with cooperativism. A lot of the youth programs I've studied, they're addressing a problem in their community and finding that cooperative ownership and a collective is a good way for them to both address an issue, uh, come together to create something that's lasting, and then they also learn a whole bunch of other things after that. Because remember, to run your own co-op, you have to understand the financing, you have to know how to communicate well with people, et cetera, et cetera. And then, as I said, it means family involvement, because most families want to see their children succeed. They come out to things their children do, whatever, so that's a way to get the adults connected back in. So I finally, I just have an example, toxic soil busters. And here's a picture of them, and then I'll go back to who they are. They're a group in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is an old industrial city that's um, in many ways uh, not faring too well. A group of young people came together because they were worried about um, lead poisoning in their backyards. Um, from the, again, it's an old industrial city, and the, especially these young uh, teenagers were worried because they're younger brothers and sisters were playing in the yard and they realized they were playing in these lead infested soils and what could they do about it. So they came together, they taught themselves um, how to collect soil samples, they found a place to do the testing, they taught themselves about lead poisoning and they also taught themselves about lead abatement. They created a company called Toxic Soil Busters, you get the name. So I don't know, maybe you guys in Europe don't, you know, originally there was some movie about Ghostbusters and so they took that, that um, connection. Um, they started their own company. They run their own company. They do have backing from a nonprofit. But they also realized that to get people to use their services, that people needed to know about the problem, right? So they actually started creating kits, not kits, skits, and other communication strategies to explain the problem. And then would go in and do an assessment and get people to hire them to do the lead abatement, which was basically they would create um, raised bed soils, and they also knew which kind of plants suck up the lead and help remove the lead from the soil, and so they would do a whole program for, for a group. Um, that that self-education and peer and community education was really the, the grounding for their organization, but also uh, it became how they started, but also how they ended, because they again continued to teach both their communities and themselves about how to do this kind of thing and what needs to be done. They also learned about how to get some laws passed so this didn't keep happening, other things like that. Because they were doing so much promotion and communication, they ended up with a video company also. So they were teaching themselves how to do video production, and then they did video production on the side. So there are lots of these spillovers. And then the leadership development involvement in the community was really important. And most of these young people actually started getting involved in the co-op community, coming to co-op conferences to present their, their company. Um, they were really upset with us in the uh, US Worker Co-op Federation because they were too young to run for the board. And they wanted to run for the board, but you had to be 18 because of all the US nonprofit laws. So, the idea is they became activists in a lot of different ways and leader. Most of them went off to college and that leadership. So again, my plea for connecting with young people, showing them how these are all co-ops and, and the importance of the social relations, doing the co-op education so that we can connect all the pieces. Um, and together we can succeed. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.